Well, thank you everybody for having me and for, for coming out on this uh, Tuesday night. And certainly, you know, I hope that uh, by the end of this presentation that I can get you sort of really sort of questioning and thinking about the way we connect to each other, the way we connect to the world, um, and hopefully that, uh, you know, can, uh, that you'll find this talk interesting, at least for the next, uh, next uh, hour or so. Um, the, and part of the credit here goes to, um, well, it goes to the whole Loudhaler team, but especially uh, my co-founder, Simon, as, as Angie mentioned. Um, so when I say I, uh, there's, it's really we um, as a team. And it's about a lot of the issues and questions that we at Loudhaler are thinking about and that I hope um, you guys will too. So the power to create your own connectivity. How does this come up? The idea for Loudhaler originally started when my co-founder, Simon, he was watching a Japanese tsunami video. And in it, there was a lady who was on the roof of her house. She had her dog in one hand and her cell phone in the other, and the house was floating out to sea. And there was a helicopter with rescuers who were buzzing nearby. But of course, all they could do was just wave at each other because the cell towers were down. And that's when we started talking about, well, why is it, right? Why is it that we take it for granted that if there's no carrier present, then we can't communicate between two devices, no matter how close they are to each other. And that's how Loudhaler got started, because we wanted to give people the power to create their own connectivity. So maybe it was too difficult to let that lady live stream her experience on Facebook, but that she should at least have the ability to create a connection from her phone to the people who were nearby and so that they could communicate to each other where shouting or screaming wasn't really viable. Now, with our technology, what we wanted to do was to deliver this in the form of software, right? Because the last thing you want to do is to make people have to buy another piece of hardware. It's already hard enough to remember your, um, uh, to remember your phone, then, then you have to remember yet another device. And also, it's not very conducive because if you're talking about a large community or you're talking about a stadium full of people, you can't expect everyone to be spending two, two $300 and yet another device to carry with their phone. Now, so going back to the idea of connecting two devices to each other, this is what we call, well, what I, what I call horizontal connectivity. So let me explain what we mean by that. In the traditional, um, in the traditional telecommunication sense. If I was sending a message to one of you, it doesn't, that message doesn't actually go from my phone directly to your phone. Instead, it's going from my phone through my carrier to my server. That's then going to your server, thousands of miles away, and then to your carrier and back down to you. So that's this vertical construct. And which is why if you don't have the carrier present, it doesn't matter how close you are to me, I can't send you that message. What we want to do is to enable what we think of as horizontal connectivity because there may be instances where I want to send information just to the group of you here without having to pay for the infrastructure, right, for um, having a carrier present. And that, this concept of connecting people to each other is what's known as mesh networks. Now, how many of you here have ever heard that term, mesh networks? Right, okay. And do you understand it in the, uh, in the context of like home Wi-Fi, or uh, how, if people can just say like, what, how have you come across that term before? Wi-Fi or larger area networks. Right. Um, now, so what's interesting about home Wi-Fi solutions when they market it as mesh networks is, if you pull the cable modem out, Right, that it doesn't really work any, anymore. It doesn't matter how many modules you have. And what we're thinking about is, can you have a, can you have a solution where even if one person leaves the network, that everybody will still function and still be able to communicate so that you don't have a central point of failure. That's what we think of as a true mesh network. Now, what's so interesting about that? What's interesting about that is, 
when I talk to other tech companies, there's actually quite a bit of resistance to, as to how much they want to support mesh networking. And the reason for that is because if you, in, this, in the vertical construct where if I'm, let's say I'm sending a, um, writing an uh, email with my Gmail account to somebody else, right? If it's a free account, um, that content can be scanned. And if you're communicating on uh, most social networking platforms, what you're sending could be, uh, could be scanned and looked at. And that, if I take that away and instead say, I'm going to connect people directly to each other and I'm not going to use a carrier, those kinds of communications cannot be monitored. And that's where, that to, to me, is where the interesting part of the technology comes in. Because you have to ask yourself, is there value to the group of us here being able to create a network to communicate with each other where we're not connected to the rest of the world? Is there value in that? And why would we need to do that? And shouldn't we have the power to do that if, say, the, the wireless network uh, carriers didn't want to put up any more cell towers here because we could be an underserved um, uh, community or there could be uh, you know, a, a, a natural disaster event, whatever the situation may be. Why shouldn't we have at least an alternative option to connect to each other in a physical community? Another idea that we think about is how we connect to people today and that it's not really by location but rather by interest. So let's say that you like the social media page of a coffee shop. Now you'll then start seeing more information and uh, more posts pushed to your feed that relates to coffee, caffeine, and that, and if the more you engage with that content, then the more you'll see from it. So social media platforms are, they do a wonderful job of connecting you to all the coffee lovers in the world, if that's your interest. But what they do a very poor job at is actually helping you figure out what you have in common with other people in your community, in your physical community. And that's because we function under this paradigm of interest not location, which is, I think, um, something that we want to get away from. And when you think about how you get digital information today, a lot of it is based on search, meaning you launch an app to find something, uh, some, to find a restaurant you want to eat nearby, or you launch a, uh, go to a search engine to look up something. Um, or you, uh, you know, go on the professional networking profile because you're trying to connect with somebody at a particular company. You have to initiate that information uh, gathering session. What we think about is, well, could we actually tell you what we think you should know? Not based on what you're searching, because you can't search for what you don't know. Right, what we're interested in finding in, 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 in tapping into is can we actually make recommendations that are based on where you're located? Because if I'm, if I'm all about coffee shops, but maybe there's, um, you know, uh, and, I'm, I'm, and I'm shopping along the main street here, um, maybe I also really like dogs, but I never search for that, and, and there's a dog rescue place nearby, but, you know, could I be made aware of it? And we're thinking about so we're thinking about a way to make you aware of information based on of, of your physical community, but in a way that's accessible and not overwhelming, but that also gives you control so that, um, so that your experience isn't purely driven by a computer algorithm, and that we can bring in more of this, uh, the delight of discovery and experience. Going back to the interest aspect of it is, you know, I think that we, we've all read a lot about echo chambers, especially in social media platforms. And the, 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 a lot of the tech companies out there, what they're trying to do is they're trying to drive engagement and they're trying to, you know, get, get your interest. And so 
the more you click on something, the more that you will see, and that's what feeds into it. And I think we have to think about, you know, is there a way to offer alternatives? And also as a way to give people more privacy so that we want to give you location relevant information, but not in a way that uh, where we're tracking you everywhere you go. So my, uh, one of my favorite examples is, you know, people talk to us about, about loud hailer technology and about Buki and they say, well, you know, isn't there a, a, a level of concern in terms of what users are giving up? Well, the value proposition that we make to our user is very clear. What we're saying is, if you want information that's relevant to where you are and what we call smart location, then you need to be on our network. But if you're, and right now we're in seven cities, um, but if you're in Paris, France, then you're outside of our network and we're not tracking you there. And you know, whatever you do there, that's fine. Um, but we are not an app where you're sharing pictures of your, of your kids or your grandkids. And by the way, we're gonna track you everywhere in the world. Um, the value proposition for us what you're giving up in terms of privacy is directly related to the benefit that you're receiving. And I think that's something that if, if, if you guys ever read the terms, of con terms and conditions of apps that you download, um, you know, it's a, it's a scary exercise, but you just think about is the privacy that you're giving up directly related to the benefit that you're receiving? Are you just playing a free video game? And then by the way, they're gonna know everywhere you go in the world, or are you getting or is the privacy that you're giving up, you know, again, directly related to the benefit? So trust um, micro communities. But first, I guess uh, an interesting um, observation that I made. I was in China, had the opportunity to go to China uh, last year. And the one thing I noticed was, uh, and this was in multiple cities that I visited, Every, every Chinese restaurant, or any restaurant in China that I walked into, the kitchen is always by the entrance. And the kitchen is always surrounded by windows. So you can see exactly what they're cooking. And if the kitchen isn't right there by the entrance, then there was a live, well, supposedly live, uh, <laughs> closed circuit feed that you could see what the cooks were doing. Um, and I asked my hosts about, well, you know, this is kind of interesting, like, why is that? And that was because there was a level of distrust about what exactly you were being served in the restaurant. And that, and that this was something which, it, it's not just in like a, the equivalent of like a diner or, you know, like a, um, like a Chinese version of Friendly's. This was also the case for like hotel, like five-star hotel restaurants as well. You could just very easily see the kitchen as soon as you walk in. Um, and that to me was really interesting because in the process of, of talking to folks in China, it also became clear that they were, citizens were more trusting of the government when it came to information than they were of peer reviews. So for example, um, there's a movement now in China where every business would be rated by the government. And the reason for that was because they didn't trust peer reviews. When I go out and I talk to small business owners across the country, one thing they always tell me that they hate is social media platforms that post a lot of reviews of their, of their establishment and that um, they have to pay in order to get the negative reviews pushed down. Um, and we also, you know, we've also seen, I don't, I don't know if any of you have seen the articles about, you know, that how much of the internet traffic is fake. Um, so it's not just fake reviews, it's not just fake users, it's not just fake accounts, it's also fake traffic. Um, so anywhere from 40 to 50% of the internet traffic they think is fake meaning it's just computer programs that's simulating as if it's people viewing websites. Um, and so that comes to, well, 
So how do we bring trust back into a digital platform? And my favorite example and what I mean by micro communities is I think about the college dorm room example. When you have your college dorm roommate, how much information are you sharing with your roommate? And how much, and how much of that information do you trust? Then we can extrapolate that to, say, the, the floor of the dorm room where you live. Now, so there's still a certain fair level of trust, but now what happens then if you move to the university campus? The wider the community, the less trust there is. And that's probably a reasonable thing to do because that human interaction level is what helps us gauge the validity and the authenticity of the information that we're receiving. And what current social media platforms do is they can take information that may be posted by a computer program, so it's not even a real person, and that's artificially created information, and yet deliver it to you as if it seems like it's coming from the person who's sitting right next to you. And you have no way of gauging well whether, you have no way of gauging whether this is a real person. It's, you know, and, and you, what you then see is, well, well this, this got reposted thousands of times. <coughs> and so what we're thinking about is, could we have digital technology and digital communication platform that can preserve and nurture this trust of a physical micro community, but still, so give you the benefit of a digital platform but still being able to preserve that level of human, human interaction trust that you otherwise would not have. And how do you have, what kind, of, what kind of technology would be necessary in order to, to give you that kind of result? So you can't really see, but the background picture is, is of a um, of a stadium at a concert and all those lights are, are phones, uh, people lit up. So <clears throat> the, the image that, uh, the reason that image really sort of captures my, my imagination is because if you see a stadium and people are there for a concert and you see all those phones, all those phones are using the CELT the cell towers, they're using the connectivity, and if there's Wi-Fi at the stadium, they're using the Wi-Fi. They're consuming this resource. And it's because of this vertical connectivity that I referred to earlier, right, which is what's, it's heavy infrastructure, it's expensive. Some stadiums have spent upwards of $100 million to connect Wi-Fi. But the truth of the matter is, you're never going to have enough connectivity to satisfy the usage of that stadium at full capacity because you, people are trying to stream video, right? So I'll give you an example. We're in the city of Columbus, Ohio. Ohio State University, during a home game day, their, home, their football stadium is seated to capacity, so it's 110,000 people. Then you have another 200 to a quarter of a million people who are outside in the surrounding neighborhoods doing, a, uh, you know, doing the tailgate party. And then you have the university campus on a regular day of 65,000 people. So it doesn't really matter how many millions of dollars you spend on Wi-Fi and on cell towers, you're never going to be able to connect everybody. And especially because there are the folks in the audience who are you know, trying to live stream to their Facebook or YouTube followers to show how cool they are. Um, and you're then also now not just streaming regular video, you're streaming 4K video, and so now that's even you know, more bandwidth. And meanwhile, you, you're just there trying to locate your friends and family to like figure out where you guys are so you can meet back up. But you're fighting for that same bandwidth as, as the folks who are streaming video. So what we think about is, well, so you have 400,000 phones there. Instead of having them being consumers of this energy, of this resource, can we actually turn them into being part of the solution? 
what if we could let every phone, when connected together in a mesh network, to create what we think of as local roads? So sure, there are the people who want to live stream the game, and that's, that's great. You, know, you need the internet for that. You need high speed bandwidth and, and all that good stuff. But for the people who are trying to locate each other, who are, say, maybe trying to order food and beer from their seat so they don't have to waste 40 minutes queuing in, queuing in line for food, can we let those phones actually be part of a local network so that they can communicate with each other? And wouldn't that be very powerful? Because you're now talking about all that computing capacity in people's phones. You're talking about hundreds of thousands of ways in which you could direct a message. You're talking about less congestion, and you're talking about people actually pitching in, and we're tapping into the collective power of, of that physical community. And the best part is when people leave, they take the infrastructure with them. So you're not, talk, you're not thinking about, oh, I'm spending $100 million to build a Wi-Fi for a stadium that gets used 10 times a year. I mean, because that's really, you know, the OSU has 10, 10 home games, and that's, that's what they would be looking at if, if that was what they wanted to do. So, and that's also part of the, when we think about also the, the more, uh, I have down here the uh, more equals better, is the consumption of this resource is only going to get worse, right? If you look at phones, Everything is more expensive, it's more pixels, it's more gigs, it's more bandwidth, it's 4K video. I think they were coming out with like 8K video. Um, and, you know, is that really better? Is, how is that helping the community? How is that helping people getting to know each other better? How is that helping a university's resources? Because at the end of the day, a university doesn't have the same resources as an NFL team. So OSU could never, at any university, could not spend $100 million on Wi-Fi, even though they may have greater demand uh, for it than an NFL team. And so hopefully one of the things that, that you guys come from today's talk is when you look at features on the new device on the phone, I think it's always good to say, you know, is it just bigger? Does that necessarily mean better? What do you want out of your phone, you know, your, your, your technology. What are you trying to do with it? Um, and probably sacril uh, sacrilege for someone in, in, the, <laughs> in the tech tech industry to be saying this, but, you know, I, I typically wait a couple of generations rather than just being a first adopter um, because there's, um, it's, I think it's I'm more interested in quality rather than quantity. And, and that so much of today's technology trends is about quantity because they're having difficulty in distinguishing themselves in the sense of quality. And finally, I think as we talk about, well, the, um, uh, the, the more equals better is to think a little bit about the digital divide. Not everybody can afford Right? If, you're, if you're going to stream 4K video, it means you need unlimited data plan. Well, not everybody can afford data plans. And going back to um, the Loudhaler solution, when we think about connecting people to each other, the way we connect them to each other is by using Bluetooth. And if you connect phones to Bluetooth, uh, phones to each other using Bluetooth, you're not paying a carrier anything. You may not be able to stream 4K video, but what we're thinking about is what are the, the essential communications, the messages that we can support? What are, you know, what is essential versus what's just fluff? Um, and, um, and that when we, by rolling out Loudhaler and making our technology available, that people can access and use our technology even if they don't have a $1,500 cell phone. So what are we trying to do at the end of the day um, with Loudhaler? You know, something that, that 
when I've go out, I, I've had the opportunity to travel quite a bit around the country, and meeting with different cities and understanding their, um, you know, what their mission uh, is and and how they're thinking about engaging with their residents and 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 visitors and giving visitors a better experience, you know, it's kind of there was this um, realization that, you know, so much of technology today is about getting it delivered, right? So you never have to leave your home. It's not just groceries, it's not just electronics, uh, it's food, it's meals, like you never have to leave. And likewise, everything is online. So why would you ever need to go to that art exhibit? Why do you ever need to go to that museum? Because you can just see the collections online. And what we want to do is we say, can we take technology but achieve the opposite, which is actually get you to go out and visit that place and actually get you to feel the need that this online experience is not the same as the physical experience, but also that when you do go there in person that you can have a better experience and a more meaningful experience and potentially also teach you about stuff that you otherwise may not have learned just from clicking from your phone. Because we believe that to strengthen the community is to encourage interaction. In talking to a number of cities, whether it's Columbus or even like say Newport, Rhode Island, they ask us about, well, you know, how can we, you know, can Loud Hailer's technology be used as a way to drive economic development? And we say, well, you know, I think trying to bridge that digital divide is certainly a key thing so that, um, so that users who cannot afford the latest gadgets but who can still be on our mesh networks can receive information that may be relevant to them. But we also think about how to increase physical activity because if you increase physical activity, you're probably also going to increase commercial activity. Now I'll give you a, an example. In Columbus, um, there are a couple of very impoverished areas, but one of which happens to host the only Confederate cemetery uh, in the northern part of the country. Um, but it's a very unknown destination. And we talked about whether by installing our technology at that cemetery that we could then encourage people to go there and make a trip to go see it because you know there are a lot of civil war buffs in this country you know, and then they'll they'll travel hundreds of miles to go see different locations and this place Camp Chase uh, was very unique and because if we can get people to go to that location that's they're spending money on transportation and if it's going to take them a little while to visit that place they may be, be hungry now those are then potential economic opportunities where we're bringing outside money now into this neighborhood and opportunities that otherwise may not be before. But what, it, but what that requires is we have to make people aware of it because they may not even know it. If they don't know it, they won't search for it. So how do we make people who are aware of it and then when they go there, give them a better experience? So, so Buki is our um, mobile app that you could download now. Um, but as Simon always likes to say, it's so much more than a, <laughs> than a mobile app, which I hope you can sort of begin to see why. But what we're looking to do is to give cities the power right, to connect with visitors and residents directly. What we're talking about is even if Loud Hailer servers go down, people can still use Buki and residents can still communicate with each other. That just because you take away the internet, or you take away Loud Hailer, it doesn't stop you from being able to engage on this platform because we are literally connecting you to each other in a way that no other platform has. And, it, and I think it'll take a little while to, to sink in about exactly what that means, but it's that you, can, you have the power to create communities and, and networks that, that no other digital platform allows. But it also means that organizations now across the community can collaborate in a way that they can't as well. 
because rather than rather than shaping your experience based on your interest because if you look at you know some of the the photo sharing uh, photo sharing platforms for example your feed is fairly much similar no matter where you are but what we want to do is to let members of the community be able to actually contribute not just content but experience on the bookie platform so that this way when you have the bookie app and you go to a different city it's a different experience every time you go and that experience is shaped by whoever the locals who are there because they want to tell you about their community and that then this way we help accentuate the unique flavors of each city and and the way we do that is again because of thinking about this horizontal connectivity using mesh networks and trying to build trust. So, any questions? Yeah, how does it work? What's the actual technology? I'm, I'm interested in the, the technical side. Sure. So, we, um, we didn't want to use carriers, right? I mean, and let, me, let me step back for a second. So, obviously, we do use the internet as part of the te technology because otherwise you can't download the app. Um, so if you were planning a trip to say Nevada City, you can look in advance for information about the city. But within that, there's also this horizontal connectivity aspect of it, which is, I, again, I said, well, we wanted to deliver this through software. So it's a mobile app that you download to your phone. But we had to then look for an antenna by which you can now connect the devices to each other. So we quickly settled on Bluetooth because Bluetooth is ubiquitous. In fact, there are more Bluetooth devices manufactured each year than there are Wi-Fi devices. Uh, last time I looked, it was two and a half billion versus two billion. So, and also Bluetooth, um, and, but within Bluetooth, there's actually a couple of different um, uh, formats of Bluetooth. And so we, we're looking at specifically what's known as Bluetooth low energy. So what that means is th there's the Bluetooth that you use for your hands-free talking in your car. And that is, um, that's high bandwidth, high quality, but it's very short distance, probably about 10 to 15 feet. Bluetooth low energy, we can get you to around 250 feet apart, uh, depending on, the, on, on your hardware. Um, but it's... It's low bandwidth, so we can't, we're not letting you stream Netflix, but you can share you know, uh, images, and, <coughs> and you can also um, you know, text, and, um, uh, text and send messages to each other. Then to extend that distance, um, well, actually, step back for a second. So the 250 feet is a sphere. So, um, so what that means is we can connect people on different floors, it's not just a, you know, not just a horizontal view, but there are environmental conditions that you have to take into consideration, just like you would with Wi-Fi and cell. Um, then we let people daisy chain off of that. So um, I may be trying to message my friends at an OSU game. If there are enough users between us, they can help relay that message on to, uh, to the intended recipients. But we have, our transmissions are encrypted. Uh, in fact, they're HIPAA compatible so that we could even handle medical information. And so this way, even if you had a hacker who was standing nearby trying to intercept these Bluetooth messages, um, they wouldn't be able to decrypt it without the decryption key. The way we pair you, so I'm sure everybody has their own Bluetooth pairing story. Um, with the Buki app downloaded, we pair you automatically and anonymously. So it's not like if you walk into a stadium, you have to accept Bluetooth pairings from so-and-so. Instead, our technology automatically detects who, with whom you have the best connections via Bluetooth, and we connect you to those folks. So we're not going to give you 10,000 Bluetooth connections on your device. Instead, we're giving you two to three connections but then each of those people are then in turn connected to two or three others. And then as, as people are moving around the facility, then we change those connections depending on the strengths of the, 
uh, of the signals. So it's on a real-time basis. Right. Now, and then the, what was interesting then is when we discovered that when we create that connection, we could also send you information. And that was where we had this epiphany about search versus push. Because with the 250 feet, we can give you what we think of as hyperlocal information, right? So if we broadcast a message here, if you're uh, halfway you know, down towards uh, the other side of this road, you're not gonna get that information. But we can send you that hyperlocal information because you're close enough to here. So we're not tracking you everywhere in the world via GPS to then decide what information to send to you via the internet. Instead, we're letting the technology decide to determine whether it's of relevance to you. If you're close enough to hear it, then it's relevant. And if you're too far away, then it isn't. Yes, a couple of questions there. One is, are we making our technology available to third-party developers? And the second is, um, how do people get to choose the content that they receive? Is there a way to select or, or filter the information that they receive? So within the Buki app, we, instead of having a single news feed that's driven by an algorithm to determine what you see, we have different topic channels. And the channels are sorted based on subject matter or they could be sorted based on neighborhood. And so if there's a topic that you're not interested in, you can unsubscribe from that channel. Um, we are thinking about whether we could let people be more granular, right? So uh, in your example of somebody who doesn't want to hear about happy hours, right now that would be within the, the dining or eat and drink channel. So we're keeping it more rudimentary where people can unselect from that channel, but you may want to know about early bird specials. If we want to give people, if we want to give users the ability to filter out just say happy hours, uh, happy hour offers, it means that we need to gather more data on them to be able to, to let them filter that out. And so that's something that we're thinking about, um, but haven't enabled as of yet. Um, the other question was third party developers. So where um, we do, want to make our technology available to third-party developers, um, but we haven't done so as of yet, and that's just a matter of scheduling in terms of development priorities and, um, and everything else. But we have, but within the Buki platform, what's interesting is we, you know, anybody who's in the city, anybody who's in the city can, um, can engage, so we have in Newport, for example, we are doing a pilot with the bridge authority so that as you're driving by, um, driving the, by the bridge, can we send you information about that day's um, construction events. But then we are also at the Newport museums. So when you're in, inside a Newport museum, you can get information about that day's exhibit and whatever else. And so, um, and we're actually also in discussions with a couple of very large transit systems, probably a couple of the biggest in the, in the world, about using our technology as a way to, um, using Buki, as a matter of fact, as a way to tell people about, um, about the uh, uh, service disruptions uh, and that where we can pinpoint it so that, say, if we have our technology on a train, we can send information about that train service just to the people who are on that train. Right. So, we, so there are a couple of ways that we handle that right now within, um, we'll just talk about it in the context of the, the Buki app. So how, how, do, how do we ensure that there's transmission of the content to everybody who should receive it? Um, the, so there is a, we do have a hardware component um, you know, I've I talked a lot about software, but we do have a hardware component, which is uh, here called a Buki box. And what we do is we impose the cost of that hardware, not on the end user, but on a, uh, on a facility. A facility that may have large numbers of people 
for certain periods of time and where the facility wants to give them a better experience and learn more about how people are using the space and to, um, uh, and to deliver that. So this way, if we have our boogie boxes set up in, 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 a, in an area, even if there was only one boogie user, he, can still, he or she can still get the benefit of the app. So an example would be, it's not just about content delivery. So some of the stuff we're working on is helping you remember where you parked. So not just which building, but actually which floor, which corner of the floor, and guiding you to your actual parking spot. And so even if there was only one Buki user in that whole facility, that um, with, the, with our technology built out, we can enable that kind of experience. But in, if we were talking about then, say, um, and, and like say the stadium example, when, when people download Buki, they're opting in to be part of the network we are using them potentially to deliver content. So we could have you know, hundreds of users that are connected directly or indirectly to a Buki box. They, at the individual user level, you cannot choose what content you're passing along. So it ensures that, but the, the, but the, the plus side of that is we, you know, if you're chatting with your friends, you have to create a user, you have to create a chat group. So, um, so there's, and, and you have to have the person's email address. You can't just, it's not like Skype, you can just look up people's, um, you, you know, look up people randomly in a directory and try to connect with them. Um, and we're not using their data plan. So, you know, because it's all being done through, through Bluetooth. Um, what's interesting is, and if you guys, decide to go do some research uh, tonight, you'll find that there are some mesh networking uh, companies out there, but the way they're thinking about mesh networks is they want to connect devices to each other where you say you have five people, but only one of them has an internet connection. They want to use the one person who has the internet connection and spread that internet connection to the other four. That's not what we're about. What we're saying is, that there is value in connecting just those five people to each other, even if they're not connected to the rest of the world. There are some very interesting business cases about, uh, business cases right now where there are projects to offer free internet but that are not performing successfully, but I don't wanna talk, <laughs> talk in a video about it. Um, right, but, but, the, um, but I can talk a little bit about Newport. So we are, um, we have a pilot set up in a low-income housing pro, uh, development called Florence Gray. And the residents there, not, a, not all of them have broadband at home, so they tend to rely on, on their mobile. And it's not unlimited, so they only have so many, um, they have only have so much uh, da uh, data on their plan. Then they also switch phones a lot, because a lot of them tend to have prepaid phones, and every time they change a prepaid phone, it's a different phone number. And so the, the community services that are trying to reach out to them to tell them about job opportunities have a diff more difficult time to reach that audience. We have a proposal in front of them where by putting, book and they also this past winter, they had this issue where the natural gas pipe into Newport Island was severed and people had no heat and they couldn't even figure out how to tell people about what to do because they, couldn't, they literally couldn't reach them other than say if they stuck pieces of paper under everybody's door. And so what we're looking at is to install Buki boxes throughout the facility. If they have the Buki app, then it's a way for them to get information without the services having to worry about keeping track of their latest phone number, that they can receive information and interact with our network without using their data plan. Um, and where, if we wanna send out information to just the people who are on that premises there, that we can do so in a very effective way. Right, so, um, so there are two types of messages um, on Buki. So one is more of the, uh, the, the, the ones related to the venue itself. And that is easier for us to ensure delivery because we have the bookie boxes around. And you may be connected, so we, and, and, and um, 
and this is happening in the field right now. So when you walk in, you're connected to multiple people. You, you're, you are actually receiving bits of that one post from multiple sources in order to reduce the time in which you receive that piece of content. Um, but if, you're, if we're talking about peer-to-peer, -peer, so you're like chatting with your friends, at, th at this stage right now, it's a little harder for us to ensure delivery um, just because of, you know, we're, lo we're looking at traffic. And so what we say to folks is that if you're, if you're within the vicinity, um, you know, say it a, very, uh, a smaller defined area and you're chatting in the message group, um, it's a lot, you know, we can ensure much better delivery. Yeah. But if we're talking about like a stadium, what we're looking at in, in terms of our development is to then route, um, route messages um, using the bookie box as well. So that's, um, you know, so then this way, it'll, if you're um, trying to message your friends at the other end of the stadium, we can still deliver that. And some of the situations I think what's interesting too is that um, with, with the uh, talking to a city, uh, city administration, they said they had a, an email inbox for residents to submit suggestions. And a very interesting problem came up was they said they had no idea whether any of these folks were actually residents. And the questions were such that they just sort of led them to question it. Um, and, um, and what's interesting for us is that, well, with the Bluetooth connection, you have to be physically there. It's, you, can't, you can't fake a Bluetooth connection from somewhere else. And so we can verify that you are at that particular location. Um, so that then we then started talking to universities. You know, when a university goes on lockdown, they have no idea where people are. And their best way to get a message out is through a Twitter feed. Now, depending on, uh, depending on the school, how many followers they have, probably only about one to 10% of the Twitter feed's followers would even see that tweet. So there's no sure compliance. But if we had boogie boxes throughout the university campus, we could actually make sure it gets out to everybody. But what it also does is we can then actually tell the university who is where so that they were doing a roll call. But then we can then tell people in one building to say lockdown and tell people in another building to evacuate. Right. So within the, um, even within the Bluetooth uh, range, BLE is the, is the uh, lightest power consuming mode. There are Bluetooth chat apps out there, but they're using the standard Bluetooth, which is they let you send images, but you're at 10 to 15 feet. That's gonna chew up a lot more power. Um, but if you, if you wanna know the fastest way to burn out your phone's battery is go to an area with no cell reception and try finding it. <laughs> it'll, it'll chew it up within, uh, within uh, hours. And so if you were in an environment where you turned off your phone cell and turned off Wi-Fi, because Wi-Fi is the second most power consumption, and you were only using BLE, then that's, still, that's going to last the longest. But of course, it also depends on how much you're using it, right? So if you're constantly firing um, messages and you're receiving content, whatever else, that's still gonna burn through it faster, but at least on a per message basis. And, I say, and I also to give you a sense is, a message on our platform, we're talking about bytes. You know, when's the last, uh, when's the last time you got an email that was only bytes? Uh, so there's not, it's not, it's not like you're getting a, a five meg uh, ad that, and you know, so, so going with the BLE connection forces us to be very economical uh, with our data packets. But what that also means is it translates into uh, power consumption or savings as well. And I gave, a, I gave a presentation at a Bluetooth conference where we were talking about this idea of like, you know, just because you're cut off from the rest of the world, why shouldn't you be able to at least communicate amongst yourselves? And the example I was talking about was uh, smart thermostats, right? I don't know if, if any of you, does anybody here have a th smart thermostat? Well, so you know, if you lose Wi-Fi or if the thermostat server goes down, it doesn't matter how close you hold your phone, you can't control that thermostat. And what we said was, well, in that situation where the server goes down or you lose Wi-Fi, 
why not let your phone talk directly to the thermostat? And people were getting out pitchforks <laughs> because, because it wasn't part of their business plan. But, but yeah, and so for us, yes, there's abs absolute value in letting a community to be able to share information with each other. And that's what this ver the current paradigm of vertical connectivity does not allow. We were, we've, I've met with uh, City of New Orleans, right? I mean, and they, they have tons of stuff to deal with. And, um, and what they're thinking about is that having our network there actually means that neighbors can actually communicate. And if they're, if they're rescuers who are driving down, they can actually use a bookie box to broadcast and, and get information and see who's around. We think about these bookie boxes, not in the context of like Wi-Fi, where you're trying to provide saturated coverage, especially if you're talking about a large physical, you know, f physical area in terms of like a city, but that we think about them in terms of engagement points and information points, so that at least, you know, if there are, you know, whether along roads or designated public areas, where that we can, um, you know, I mean, I haven't studied uh, your topography to come up with a specific kind of recommendation, but that at least you create pockets of connectivity where people can at least you know, share information within that area. Um, if you're in a more densely populated, then obviously then that's easier to spread um, over throughout the entire community. Um, but even like in a stadium or a convention center, what we tell, tell them is just think about it as engagement points. Where do people go? Where do you want them to go? And that's where you can have, um, you know, that's where you can host these points. Yeah, so this can, um, this can draw power over Ethernet if you plug an Ethernet cable in. But it can also be wired up to a battery. So it could be a solar power battery. And it's, this is industrial grade, so it can actually be outdoors, um, you know, sitting up like this. Um, we had met with uh, Mohonk Preserve in New York. And they have about 14 square miles, of which over eight have no cell coverage whatsoever. But it's a very popular destination with mountain climbers. And people die, about a dozen people die each year uh, from falling. And what we're t talking to them about is setting up bookie boxes, you know, not trying to cover the entire area, but at least where the trails are, um, having them be solar powered so that if people had an issue, they could use their phone to just send a very simple message to call for help. So that's, so what we're thinking about is, okay, you know, you can't, it's too expensive to try and plug in cell tower for a nature preserve for such a large area, but is there something that we could do, you know, that could at least cover, say, 50% of the kinds of scenarios that we're talking about? Again, sort of this light infrastructure kind of approach. Right, so, um, so what's interesting uh, from our perspective is with, if you have the Bookie app, you're op the reason why you download it is because you want to learn more about your physical community, right? So it's not like, it's not like you, you downloaded a professional networking app and we're trying to sell you ads about what the stores are there to, nearby. So, and then from there, the 250 feet, the hyperlocal is about digitizing impulse shopping. Right, so it's one thing to send you, again, this is opt-in, right? But it's one thing for me to get an email about a sale on, but if I'm hundreds of miles away, what good is that? Versus if I'm walking distance, 250 feet, and being made aware of, of uh, ice cream special or whatever else, then, and the fact that I'm, I'm receptive to getting this offer because I have this app on my phone, that's where we think it's interesting. Now, the way we go into a city is we want to look at, well, why are people coming here? We want to make sure that we're providing them a value, we're providing them a service. And in a lot of the other cities that we're at, we have a major partner who is a people magnet. So it could be a stadium, it could be a convention center. In Newport, uh, we're at the Newport mansions, they draw a million visitors a year. Well. <laughs> when the people come to Newport, they look at the mansions, they got to eat, they could have had some place that, you know, they want to shop. And so that becomes a very easy tie-in to then help broadcast and support the local businesses there. 
because people are coming to the mansions, they're downloading the app, or they're going to Fort Adams, which also draws a million people a year. Um, and that's a way how the community works, right? Because right now, if you think about social media networks, I could like the page of the Newport mansions, but that tells me nothing about the other businesses that are in Newport. It's, it's kind of like everybody's in their own little silo. Um, again, sort of vertical platforms. And what's interesting for us is the Buki platform is if you're on our platform to look at Newport Mansions, we get to tell you about everything else that Newport has to offer. Thank you for having me. <laughs>